Hi everybody. Today uh, we begin the book of Isaiah and really it's an introduction to the whole of the prophetic literature. So in this particular lecture, this first one, I'd like to do a couple of things, five in fact. I'd like to look first at why study the prophet Isaiah. Then, who or what is a prophet in the Old Testament? Thirdly, what does the prophetic literature in the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, look like? Fourthly, what's the book of Isaiah all about? And finally, who was Isaiah and what sort of world did he live in? So the first of these then is, why study Isaiah? I think the basic reason why we as Christians study Isaiah is because Jesus himself saw much of who he was in terms of the ministry of the prophet Isaiah. And certainly the early Christians, as they tried to grapple with the mystery of Jesus, would go back to the prophet Isaiah more than to any other book in the scriptures. So he's fundamental to Jesus. So I'd just like to point out a couple of passages from Isaiah and, and you can see pretty quickly how they do relate to Jesus. Here's one from chapter 6. Go and say to the people, hear and hear again, but do not understand. See and see again, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people gross, its ears dull and its eyes shut so that it will not see with its eyes, nor hear with its ears, nor understand with its heart, and be converted and be healed. So what's happening here is that for Jesus, that he, he sees this, he understands this in Isaiah, and now he understands of why in his own preaching the people are not understanding, are not picking it up. Why, in a sense, he's preaching fails after some time. Then the very next chapter, chapter 7. The Lord himself will give you a sign. It's this. The maiden is with child and will give birth to a son whom she will call Emmanuel. Now the early church in Matthew reading this was amazed of course and saw it come true in Jesus. We won't go into uh, the background of this at this moment, but he was using the Septuagint, the Greek version of the scriptures, and it had a maiden, well, a virgin, a maiden, will, will be with child. And of course that was Mary. And his name will be Emmanuel. And of course that is Jesus. Then, in chapter 9, just two chapters later, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. On those who live in the land of deep shadow, a light has shone. For there is a child born for us, a son given to us, and dominion is laid on his shoulders. And this is the name they will give him, Wonder Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. Of course, we see that as Jesus, as Jesus. Much later, chapter 40, come across these words. A voice cries, prepare in the wilderness a way for Yahweh. Make a straight highway for our God across the desert. Let every valley be filled in and every mountain laid low. Prepare in the wilderness. We see in that, of course, the ministry, the life of John the Baptist. And then, uh, a few chapters later, we have the wonderful four great poems that we name the Servant Songs. And they, we see in them Jesus and his, his death. Listen to this. Without beauty, without majesty, we saw him. No looks to attract our eyes. A thing despised and rejected by all. A man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. And yet ours were the sufferings he bore. 
ours the sorrows he carried. But we, we thought of him as someone punished, struck by God and brought low. Yet he was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. On him lies a punishment that brings us peace, and through his wounds we are healed. That is from the wonderful second part of Isaiah. Extraordinary stuff. We could have used other, other passages from Isaiah because a lot of other ones are, are used too in the words of Jesus or the early church to understand the mystery of the Lord. So that's really why we as Christians should get to know this extraordinary prophet. Secondly, now, who or what is a prophet. What's prophecy all about? Well, just in a general sense first. In the ancient world, there are people who are recognized as having an ability to interpret events that are happening in a way that's really beyond the normal way of, uh, of human understanding. And so, these specially gifted people would use natural phenomena, such as the movement of the stars, or the way the birds fly, or they would throw lots or dice, perhaps even interpret dreams or visions, sometimes communicate with the dead. Whatever way they used, they were trying to communicate with the world of God and to understand God's plan. God's ways. And so we see in Ezekiel chapter 21 the king of Babylon trying to decide who is going to attack first, either Jerusalem or the Ammonite king. The king of Babylon, it says in verse 21, stands at the fork of two roads. To use divination, he shakes arrows, he consults the teraphim, he inspects the liver of a bird to interpret which way to go. And all through Jewish history in the, in the old world, lots were cast, especially when choosing somebody to lead a people or discern whether a person is guilty or innocent, right up to, in fact, the choice of a successor of Judas in the Acts of the Apostles. Now, in all this, there's sort of a high end of this, and that's when we would use the word prophet. Somebody who's a prophet, not just has special gifts, but we'd actually call him or her a prophet. The Hebrew word is nabai. We don't know what it means. It possibly comes from the word to call. And when that's translated into Greek, the word is prophetes prophet, and that simply means a spokesperson. Although the Jewish scriptures say there were prophets in the days of Moses, we really only hear clearly about prophets at the times of the first kings, Saul and David, and perhaps a generation or two previously. And these uh, prophets are attached to shrines or the royal court. And we say that they're not institutional like the priests, but they are a bit charismatic in the sense that they have to have the gifts. They're charismatic. They've got these gifts of being able to speak uh, the plans of God, speak things from God's perspective. My favourite Old Testament theologian is Walter Brueggemann, and he says this, the task of the prophetic ministry is to nurture, to nourish, and to evoke a consciousness and a perception of things which is an alternate one to the consciousness and, and uh, perception of things in the dominant culture. And the alternative vision, consciousness, of course comes from God, as 
in the Torah, as we know of God's ways to us 